The following program is a paid presentation. Wake up to the Word. Share an uplifting hour with grace and glory and Baltimore's faithful. Well, good morning and happy new year from all of us here at Baltimore's number one gospel program, Grace and Glory. That's because of you and we're grateful. Uh, of course, each week we look forward to inspire, encourage and empower as well as to greet for the first time in the new year, uh, a name that you should know, First Lady Lenyard Robinson from Dream Life Worship Center. Of course, this is that time of the month for your women's segment. I understand yes. you have an interesting guest today. Yes, we do. We are, first of all, Happy New Year happy to new you. Happy New Year. Happy it's okay. a blessing to be in the new year. But yes, we have two ladies today who have co-authored an anthology on the subject of prayer. Prayer. And I love the subject of prayer, yes, so indeed. absolutely, yes. Much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little, little power. power. No prayer. No power. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> so we're looking forward to that. Yes, sir. Okay, so First Lady Robinson will be back with her guests, but first let's make our way to our first spoken word coming from Bishop Dante Hickman over at Southern Baptist Church right here on Grace and Glory. Welcome to the television broadcast ministry of Southern Baptist Church. And now a word from our pastor, Dr. Dante L. Hickman, Sr. By the time of our particular text, we are introduced to a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. A Pharisee was a separated religious sect of Jewish leaders who were strict students and scholars of the laws of Moses. They were the keepers of religious purity, religious traditions, and sanctity. In a real sense, they were righteous people who held people accountable to the laws of God that made them a covenant called out community of God. However, the Pharisees became the villains in the Bible when they couldn't shift from their theological and traditional ideals towards the transformational impact of God. They couldn't shift from religion about God to a relationship with God. They couldn't shift from the letter of the law to the love of the Lord. And the problem occurs when the religious person is more comfortable with being religious than they are with becoming spiritual. Coming to church is religious, but worshiping God when you get there or if you don't is spiritual. Giving an offering is religious, but bringing your tithes and offerings is spiritual. Reading and memorizing scripture is religious, but learning and living the principles of scripture is spiritual. And at some point in our lives, we have to evaluate ourselves and elevate ourselves from being more religious to becoming more spiritual. Nevertheless, the problem with the Pharisees was that they had become comfortable with what the church was giving them. They were comfortable with their attention getting, their accoutrements and trinkets, and they had become comfortable with their accomplishments. You see, church, you can get to a successful and satisfactory place in life where you start feeling like you don't need to make any adjustments. And you won't admit it, but you'll start acting like you don't need the church. You start acting like you don't need the congregation. And then you'll get to a point where you don't even need the Christ. Subsequently, we start shrinking from ministry responsibilities. 
And all of a sudden, we come to church when we feel like it. With an expectation of how it should be, what we should get, and when it should be over. And like the Pharisees, you've been in church so long that you think you have outgrown some stuff. But the fact of the matter is, you don't know what you don't know. And I know what the problem is. It's difficult for a person who has been in churchianity more than they've been in Christianity to humble themselves and go back and grow again. Help me preach and look at your neighbor and tell them sometimes you gotta go back and grow again. But this text demonstrates that there comes a point when you start recognizing the presence and power of God beyond all your pretense and prevarication. Big word simply means deviating from the truth. And when church people see the move of God, they want to master it. But it cannot be mentally obtained and constrained. Now listen to this because it's unfortunate, but for a lot of us, our salvation is mental. We get saved in our heads, but not necessarily in our hearts. And, and this is where it gets dicey. Because once you accept Christ as your savior by faith, you are saved. And you're given the Holy Spirit. But you may not give in to the Holy Spirit beyond your mental consent. And that's why the old folk called it straddling the fence. You got one side in church and the other side in the world. That's why you want everybody to love you, but you can't love nobody. You want everybody to forgive you, but you can't forgive nobody. Subsequently, your whole religion and faith walk is in your brains, but it's not in your behavior patterns, and it's not in your belief system. So that as long as everything's going well in your life, you got joy. You got a smile on your face. As long as all your bills are paid, wind is at your back, ground is rising to your feet, you come into church, I got to praise. And I got to get it out. But when it comes time to go through the valley, when it comes time to deal with sickness and loneliness and brokenness, your faith goes out the window. And before you know it, you become a Pharisee. Like Nicodemus, who was convinced that Jesus had the power and the presence of God. Because he said, Rabbi, we know that nobody can do these signs unless they've been sent by God. Pastor, we know. You got the power in the presence of God, but not enough to shift us from being covert Christians. Talk, Dante. Verse 2 says, this man came to Jesus not at the 8 o'clock service. He didn't come at 1130. What does your Bible say? He came, came at night. He came at a time when he felt the public wouldn't notice that he needed Jesus too. And I'm afraid there are a lot of people like that who are sophisticated, 
who are high cut glory, who are bougie, who got big time positions, they drive nice cars, live in a nice neighborhood, they got money in the bank, but they don't want nobody to know they need Jesus too. You read their social media timeline and you would think that they pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps and Jesus ain't nowhere on your feet. The problem in the world today is we got too many undercover saints. Why y'all like to be saints when you in church but not when you at home? You like to shout while you're on Chester Street. But on your job, don't nobody know you like Jesus. Too many of us are ashamed to admit I need the Lord. And I wonder if there's anybody in here that can testify I need the Lord more, more than I need anything else. Whether I get a husband or a wife or not, whether I get a job or not, whether I get the degree or not, I need the Lord in my life. And, and as I continue to grow in my faith, the less I want to live my life by misperceptions. Tired of trying to make everybody else feel good about me. And I feel bad about myself. I don't care what room I'm in or what position I have. I'm team Jesus. Do I have a witness in here? I don't care if I'm in the White House, the State House, or City Hall. I'm team Jesus. I don't care if I'm working out at the gym. I don't care if I'm in the club. I'm team. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, I wouldn't be where I am now. You think I'm gonna deny him because you don't know him? I'll scream it in your face. I love Jesus. Some of us know he's got the power and the presence of God, but not enough to shift us from being covert Christians, and it gets deeper, to shift us from being caught up with trying to comprehend everything. Listen to that Nicodemus. How can a man be born <laughs> when he's old? Now see, Jesus talking spiritual. His mind is in the flesh. How can a man be born when he's old? I'm too old. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? That's nasty. See, 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 this is that intellectual salvation. This kind of person that needs to know everything before they move forward with anything. But you know what I found out, church? There are some things that God is going to do in your life this year that just ain't going to make sense to you, your family, and nobody that knows where you come from. <laughs> Almost 40 years ago, I told my mother I was called to preach and that I was going to college. She said, use a fool. You, you ain't going to college, Dante. You've been kicked out of three high schools. You don't have a diploma. Why don't you go down to Sparrows Point, be a real man, get a real man job. Talking about you called and going to college and you done been to three high schools and been put out. You ain't got no degree. I said, I'm going to get a degree. How you going to get it? I went up to the community college. I took a test. I hadn't gotten beyond the 10th grade. I passed all five parts. I got my GED. And I went to the registration at Catonsville Community College. And the Negroes that knew me in school 
saw me registering, they said, what you applying for the janitor job? I said, no, nah, Negro. <laughs> I was saved, but I wasn't sanctified. <laughs> said, I'm applying for college. He said, I ain't see you at graduation. I said, that's all right. You ain't going where I'm going. And I not only got my bachelor's, I got my master's and my doctorate. And I ain't had no scholarship. You know what I had? School loans and food stamps. And when I got to where I am by faith, God allowed me to pay all of my school loans off. And my first fiance mother said, you lost a good one because he did exactly what he said he was going to do. When you trust God by faith, it ain't going to make sense. That's why the wife I got now got me. Cause when she got me, I had holes in my shoes. She saw the holes. I had a car. I had to get in through the back door. Randy, you remember that car? Came and preached at First Mount Olive. And I couldn't get in through the front door. I had to get in the back. Bishop Brown told Randy as his armor bearer, go pull the pastor preacher's car down. I said, nah, Randy, you ain't got to do it. Bishop said, shut up, let him go get your car. I went to Randy and said, look, yo, you got to go in through the back to get to the front. He said, I got you. I got, matter of fact, that's a good word right there. Sometimes you got to go in through the back to get to the front of where God wants you to be. And where God is taking you, it ain't going to make God told me to tell you, church, he's going to take your two fish and five barley loaves and give you an overflow. He's going to heal your body, bless your children, pay your bills, give you a house, and make your money stretch. And he sent me here to ask you, do you want dollars or do you want cents? I need somebody to answer the question. I need somebody to shout any way you bless me. I will be satisfied. I don't need it to make sense. God, just work it out. Yeah. Nevertheless, while Nicodemus was content with being a covert Christian, trying to comprehend everything, what he needed was to be converted and changed in his heart he needed to realize that he could not come to Jesus and want the difference without becoming the difference come on look at somebody and tell them this year I gotta become somebody different because too many of us love what Jesus has to offer but we don't love Jesus we don't live like him, we don't love like him, and we don't lift others like him. We want his knowledge, his wisdom, his power, his healing, his provision, his forgiveness, his anointing, his fishes and loaves and his miracles, but we don't want him to be Lord over our lives. And that's why you will always be frustrated, dissatisfied, and unfulfilled with your religion without a spiritual walk with the Lord. And you sit here play mind games and mental gymnastics with yourself. But Jesus said in this text, in order to see, understand, and enter into the things of the kingdom of God, you must be. You gotta be born again. You'll never be able to embrace any vision that I tell you. You'll never be able to give biblically, obediently, and sacrificially. You'll never be able to serve faithfully, and you won't ever be able to worship God authentically until you are born again. 
oh my God, this is going to hurt right here. Because I dare to submit this, that a lot of us are saved, but we need to be born again. Oh my God. You saved, but you need to be born again. You, you accepted the, the finished work of Christ on the cross that was enough to save you from the penalty and the power of sin and the presence of sin. You ain't going to hell. You're going to heaven. You're saved, but you ain't been born again. Because to be born again is to receive the Savior. Listen at verse 3. Unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. See, church, I know you have received salvation. But have you received the Savior? For Nicodemus, this meant that he would have to embrace Jesus beyond his limited perception of him. Listen to what he said. They were talking about him. Pharisees watched him. They was in church with y'all. They heard him preach. They saw him heal. They said, uh, yo, he got something, yo. My guy, <laughs> he a little different than us. He know that word, and he got some demonstration. Anybody, you ever heal somebody sick? You ever got the devil out? Man, who is he? I don't know, yo, but I'm going to go talk to him. I'm going to find out what's up with him. See if he want to hang with us. Hey, Jesus. Yo, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher, capital T, come from God. See, that's how the devil butter you up. He diffuses you, making you think he's with you and on your side, but all the while, he's trying to bring you down to his level. We know your teacher sent from God, and that's what we do to Jesus. We limit him to the parameters of our prerogative. <laughs> and we sing songs like we make a miracle work a promise keep a light in the darkness but let me let me bust your bubble he's more than your way maker your miracle worker your promise keeper, your light in the darkness. He is not your sugar daddy. He is Lord. I need some real saints to jump up and shout, he is Lord over my life. Stop putting Jesus in the position of giving you everything and you ain't giving him nothing. He's Lord. That means he's the boss. He's Charles and George. He's in control of my life. And the problem with some of you Pharisees is you want him to be your savior while you be the Lord. Until you need something. But when you make him Lord, he will not only save you, he'll liberate you. He'll elevate you. He'll validate you. And he'll mitigate against all evil that's coming against you. And you ain't going to have to worry about nothing and nobody. You'll be able to say like David, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. You'll be able to say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid when the wicked, even my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh? They'll stumble and fall. And though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. To be born again is to receive him as Savior. But then secondly, it is to release 
your self-righteousness. Look at the person beside you and tell them, get over yourself. Oh my God. Most surely I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh, I don't care how you dress it up. I don't care how much money you got on it. I don't care what kind of bag you got, what shoes you wear, how long your hair, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, a person without God's Holy Spirit is purely flesh. They ain't got no spiritual eyes. They ain't got no spiritual ears. They don't have a spiritual heart to see, hear, and comprehend the message, miracles, and manifestations that Jesus has come to bring. That's why you got to be careful of who you hook up with in this season. If they are not spiritual on the inside, they're going to drain you dry on the outside. They'll never measure up. They'll never equal out. They'll never yoke up to you. They'll never make you happy. I don't care how fine she is and how bad he is I don't care how much money they got if they ain't spiritual they're going to take you straight to hell come on look at your neighbor and tell him it's just a matter of time when you got the Holy Ghost he transforms you on the inside he brings new life a new understanding and a new desire. Before he came into my life, I was dead in my trespasses. I was dead in my sins. I had no conscience of my wrongdoing. I did stuff to people and I didn't care what I did and how it made them feel. But since I've been saved, it doesn't mean I don't do some bad stuff, but I feel bad about the bad stuff I do. And every day I wake up, I ask God to forgive me of my sin. The stuff I know and the stuff I don't know. And help me to change my ways. When I was not born again, I was limited by what I could see and what I could understand. But now, by the Spirit, I can see beyond what I can see. And I can believe beyond what I have the capacity to know for certain. And I'm here to tell you, no matter how you try to present yourself in the physical, you look so much better from the spiritual. Look at your neighbor and tell them it's not about what you put on. On the outside, but it's about who you are on the inside that shines through that's why Jesus said let your light shine stop trying to outshine the light of God because the more you try to outshine the light the more we see how ugly you really are but when you let the light of Christ shine in your life nobody can see your spots nobody can see your scars nobody can see your sins and nobody can see your shortcomings I'm here to tell you that you look better than what it is that you're going through I need you to help me preach look at your neighbor and say I can't tell the hell you're going through because when you got the Holy Ghost on the inside he makes you look better than you could have ever looked on the outside. Can I preach like I feel it? I feel like lifting him up. God sent me back here to tell you on the first Sunday of the year that if you're going to get the extraordinary things he has for you, you must be born again. You got to receive the Savior. You got to release your self-righteousness. But then finally, you got to rely on the Spirit of God. I need you to shake somebody's hand like you're going to shake it off and say, neighbor, everything that God has for you is for you. And the devil can't stop it when you rely on the Spirit of God. 
You've been watching the television broadcast of Southern Baptist Church, where Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. is the pastor. Welcome back, welcome back, and Happy New Year. This is the women's segment of Grace and Glory, and today is our author spotlight, which you know we like to do every once in a while. So today, would you welcome our guests, Dr. Renee Huffman and Dr. Katrina Shaw as co-authors of a very, very special book that we're gonna talk about today. Welcome to the women's segment of Grace and Glory. Thank you so much. Happy New Year to you, ladies. Happy New Year. All right, every once in a while we have an author spotlight, and today we have two authors with us and so tell us about your book it is about something that is very close to my heart yes. so talk to us about what this is okay well it's victorious in prayer uh, VIP mm -hmm. you know and it's so and you know it's so important for us to have a foundation of prayer mm -hmm. um, to make it first sure and we're in the new year yes so you want to start out with God every morning. Yes. And so it starts out with marriage. Mm -hmm. It starts, and also we have family. These are the different chapters. Mm -hmm. And we have um, healing. Mm -hmm. uh, we have so many different chapters. And it's just so important for us to start the day out praying for everyone in the family, for praying for the children. Mm -hmm. We even have a section for just for children. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going through so much. Absolutely. And so just making everyone, you know, everyone first, mm -hmm. making God first, making prayer first, making the family first. Sure. So. And this book was your idea. This was your God yes. idea. Well, and, and I see you've collaborated with not only with Dr. Christina Shaw, mm -hmm. but also other authors. Yes. A lot of authors are collaborating with other authors. Why was it important to you to put this in writing? Well, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, I was coming from a spiritual conference mm -hmm. and I seen on the back of the car VIP. Mm -hmm. I thought this was going to just be a nonfiction book that I that I was going to compose myself. Mm -hmm. And God said, write an anthology, bring the women in, yeah. bring women in to pray. Mm -hmm. And so we would get on Zoom together, you know, and pray and God showed up, worship while we were actually writing this anthology. Sure, that's powerful. Ooh. And so which chapter did you write yourself in VIP? Well, I am, I'm, the, the name of the publishing company is called Covered in Dignity Publishing, which I am the owner Awesome. And so I am the visionary of mm -hmm. this book. So I did the introduction. I love that. And just going over every, you know, children, family, yeah, marriage, healing, mm -hmm. her, praying for her, praying for him. Sure. Um, and so it's just so important so for you, us to have you were the author, visionary, and director. Yes. And what about you, Dr. <laughs> Shaw? What, which chapter did you author in this book? Healing. Healing. Oh, yes. Tell us a little bit about your chapter. Oh, I'm going to tell you a lot about it. Uh, first of all, I was so grateful to be one of the co-authors in this powerful book because mm -hmm. prayer is like the first and foremost. Mm -hmm. we, prayer comes first. Prayer is just the first thing I usually I do every day. Mm -hmm. And healing is so, so important to me because um, I actually am a CEO and co I'm founder of a um, nonprofit. And it's sure. called Maine. Stands for Mammograms is Not Enough. Mm -hmm. I'm a 10-year breast cancer survivor. I love that. Awesome. And, uh, and my husband happens to be an 11-year prostate cancer survivor. Praise God. And God um, just um, prepared me and had him go first, and I came afterwards. And both of us, you know, we, we, we prayed together. We, we went through the, uh, this journey that we didn't know together. Mm -hmm. And healing to me is so important because we need healing in so many aspects of our sure. lives, not in mind, body, and soul. Mm -hmm. And when we, not only is prayer important, but when we pray, we got to believe, believe what we're praying. Amen. And, we, and knowing that God is going to bring it to pass and receive it. I love that. So God took yes. you through a journey yes. of healing, and you're able to put it in writing. Yes. Yes. It, listen, this is a resource. I, yes. I often say in our intercessory repair times at Dream Life Worship Center that prayer is a kingdom technology. Yes. And this is a resource that you can use, that our viewers can use. Mm -hmm. It's a kingdom technology. And oftentimes some people think it's more difficult than what it is. Yes. But thank God for, for things like this to show people that yes. it's as simple as talking, starting a conversation with mm -hmm. God. Yes. Well, ladies, thank you so much. How can our 
viewers get their hands on VIP? Well, you can go to Amazon.com mm -hmm. and just type in Victorious in Prayer. Mm -hmm. We are our number one bestseller, mm -hmm. so you can definitely purchase it there or go to WomenOfDignityMagazine.com. I love that. Amazon, everybody, you all yes. know how to get on Amazon, okay? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so get on Amazon and get yes. your Victorious in Prayer, right. all right, by Dr. Renee Huffman with a collaboration of other authors and get your year started off powerfully in prayer and watch God work in your life. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you for sharing with us today. And you stay tuned as you get ready to go to church because up next is our next spoken word from Bishop Jermaine Johnson, pastor of the Word of Life Christian Community Church. So stay tuned. Good morning and welcome to the Word of Life Christian Community Church Catalyst for Life televised broadcast where we are led by Bishop Jermaine Johnson and co-pastor Elder Michelle Johnson. We are located at 3300 Glen Avenue in Baltimore, Maryland. We pray that you are blessed by the Word for we believe that it all begins with the Word for the Word is life. 2024, we've been granted the authority to activate, to activate the word, the work, and the witness of the person and work of Jesus Christ. All of this comes in partnership with the church, the ecclesia. Ecclesiology can be defined as the doctrine of the church, the study of the church, the, organ, the origins of Christianity, its relationship to Jesus, the church's role in salvation, its discipline, its polity, its order. The ecclesia, say that with me, the ecclesia, the study of the church, church according to Jesus and Peter at Caesarea Philippi, Matthew 16 and 18, where Jesus says to Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The manifestation of the church took place on the, the day of Pentecost with the coming of the Holy Spirit and its new work of sealing and permanently indwelling in believers. Y'all, the church, the ecclesia is part of the body of Christ, the part that belongs to him, and it's an intimate part of him. The latter part of this ecclesiology is the purpose of the church, a process that comes from the mouth of the post-resurrected Jesus. as He comes to bring a sense of order, a sense of stability, a sense of strength by giving us a sense of direction, by granting us the great commission. That is right there in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, where he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. That, that purpose, that commission, <clears throat> is later followed by the power that was established in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse number 8, where Jesus gave the instructions that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The gospel in its simplicity is defined as the good news of Christ, y'all. And good news can describe the person and work of Jesus Christ. And throughout the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all have a theme of preparation and power. Every teaching, every miracle, every demonstration of love directs you and I to Calvary. It directs you and I to the finished work of Christ. For each gospel writer took a different route, but their mission and their goal was the same, to transform us that we may become disciples of Christ. The goal of each uh, gospel writer is to disciple us, to empower us, to educate us, to inform us as followers of Christ, that we 
have a responsibility to uh, follow God's word, to abide in his work, and ultimately become an effective witness for the advancement of the gospel. I'm grateful that God has a lot of confidence in us. Look at your neighbor and say, God has confidence in you. <laughs> He gives us instructions to be followers of Christ. I'm grateful to be your pastor and your bishop, but you follow me as I follow Christ. Somebody thank God that we have a roadmap in following Christ. It would be very difficult for you to follow me if you don't have a relationship with Christ. I am because of him. Paul says in Acts 17, 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. Anybody grateful for the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel that gives us direction and insight? Y'all, the gospels are, are made up of four gospel writers, all of which are, are charged of telling this story. Mark's gospel, he portrays Jesus uh, as a servant and a redeemer, and he likens him to a bull representing service and power. Luke's gospel has portrayed Jesus as the, the perfect man. He's represented as a God of wisdom and character. John portrays Jesus as the son of God, which represents him as an eagle with an emphasis on his deity and his person. But the gospel of Matthew, our gospel today, it portrays Jesus as king with a symbol of a lion that represents strength and authority. And here we are in your year to manifest your strength and authority. You have a commission to activate the authority that God has possessed you. And Matthew writes this gospel as he draws our attention today with an expectation for us to activate the strength and the authority based on your previous seasons of preparation. Good God Almighty, anytime we speak of strength and authority, one would suggest that you have some experience. You've been exposed to something. And I encourage you today that based on your experience and your exposure with God's word, that it's time for you and I to activate the strength and the authority that you possess. I'm trying to tell you, based on on what you've been through, based on what you've been an eyewitness, based on what you was able to overcome. They were your prerequisites that qualified you to be a bona fide witness for Christ. That now is your time. Look at your name and say, now is your time. You aren't one who is wondering that if I have a problem, I'm not wondering if there's a solution. I've come to understand that the solution may not come on my time, but I'm strong enough to know that God shows up at the appointed time and at the right time. I don't just quote the scriptures, but I've come to understand that weeping endures for a night, but as I'm serving with God, there's an appointed day for joy to come. Do I got a witness in the house today? That I may be in a new year, but I'm serving the same God. And the same God that keeps making a way day after day, month after month, year after year. I just happen to believe that God has me on schedule for exceeding abundant blessing that I could ever ask or think. Can you thank God for the plans that God has for you? Y'all, Matthew's gospel is not to an unfamiliar audience but he's writing to a people that are familiar with God's ways, familiar with God's rules. Matthew writes to a culture who knows the word of God. Now he's trying to get them past the law of just being ritual about this to now being in relationship 
about this. I'm trying to get you past the point of just knowing about God, but your testimony is I'm going to know him for myself based on my ability to be exposed to the things of God. Anybody grateful that God allows certain things to happen in your life? And it may have been a test. It may have took you out, but you and I got a testimony. Can you type that in? I got a testimony that God can do it. Just look down your row and say, God can do it. Beloved, we're not just hearers of the word, but we are challenged throughout the text to be doers of the word. It's just not enough to be present, but we must become active participants. Somebody say, I'm an active participant. My, my faith ain't just something that I'm saying I have, but I'm an active participant in my faith. I believe that as we worship God, we are active and we are activating the authority that God has laid out for our lives and Jesus teaches us throughout the gospel of Matthew the importance of development training and preparation because as we grow in stature it's important that we grow in the grace of the things of God in your time of preparation every experience and every encounter has been accounted for I'm grateful, y'all, for whatever it took to get you to 24, whatever it took to allow you to be a part of the Word of Life Church in the 12th year, whatever it took for you to make it to January the 7th, January the 7th, I want you to know that it was part of God's plan. Can you get excited that I'm right on schedule? I'm right where God wants me to be in spite of my brokenness, in spite of my frustration, in spite of my times of feeling lost. I, I want you to know the compass of heaven uh, was able to locate you uh, and you happen uh, to be identified as purpose. Uh, you happen to be identified as one who is on their way, uh, as one who's on schedule uh, for a breakthrough. Somebody just shout out breakthrough. Uh, I'm grateful that God knows how to find me. Can you thank God today uh, that he knows how to find me? I'm glad you didn't quit. I'm glad you didn't give up. I'm grateful that you made a decision to live. Somebody shout live. I made a conscious decision that I'm going to live through the pain, live through the uncertainty, live through the wilderness, live through the grief. Somebody thank God for life today that I made a decision in spite of what the enemy tried to whisper, but I made it a conscious decision that I'm going to live. The the enemy declares that he's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I made a decision in this year with the permission of God and his heavenly host that I'm going to live and not die. Can you take about 15 seconds and just thank God for the decision that you made to live. In spite of how you felt, you made a decision to live. In spite of what was going on in your life. You made a decision to live. I'm not only going to live, but I'm going to live with authority. And as we arrive on the scene of the text, we find Jesus in a place of power and authority. Yo, he's done what he's been assigned to do. His preparation has paid off. His persistence has paid off. The provision of the partnership with his father has taken place. Jesus has done exactly what he said. He is living with resurrection power. In other words, Sandy, he's on the other side. He has just defeated death, hell, and the grave, and he happens to be on the other side. And if you don't even know that or not, last time you was in church on a Sunday, you were on, you were in the year 23. But I want you to know that like Jesus in the text, you happen to be on the other side. You done messed around with all your issues, with all that's going on, with all the uncertainties of your life. You done messed around and woke up on the other side. And if you can't celebrate that, I want to take a few moments and celebrate that for you. You didn't even see it coming, but I'm grateful today that like Jesus was on the other side of death, 
you on the other side of your storm. Can you just take a few moments uh, and just praise God uh, that you are on the other side of it? Uh, all that happened in 23, it wasn't enough to keep you down. Here you are on the other side of it. And guess what? Now that you're on the other side, God has a set of instructions uh, that he's about to give you. Uh, in the first set of instructions, he tells you uh, that you got permission. Somebody thank God, I got permission. I got permission to live. Oh, good God Almighty. If that's not enough to stop and give God praise, uh, I don't know what is. You and I got permission uh, to live. Death couldn't keep you. Thank God uh, that I got permission. Time of our text, Jesus, y'all, is on the other side of death. He uh, took on the death for the sins of humanity. He, prior to this, he we saw him being dragged from judgment hall to judgment hall. We found him with a crown of thorns on his head and nails and he was being persecuted and he was being mocked and you're going to tell me a few days later the next time we see him we find him on the other side meeting up with his disciples giving him them the next set of instructions he's giving them the next part of the puzzle because when you're going through the process oftentimes the finished product don't look nothing like the process and the process it looked like you ain't going to finish. In the process, it feels like you're going to die. In the process, it feels like you're going to get stuck. But Jesus shows us that you got to keep on going. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to keep on going. Because the next time we see him, he didn't resurrect it with all power in his hand. I'm <coughs> finishing his assignment, and now he's gathered with his disciples. The Bible says, verse 16, that he gets with the 11. He gets with his disciples who walked with him, who experienced all the teaching and the preparation, but now they're able to see the manifestation. And I'm going to say thank you for walking with us through the vision casting and the training and the development. Now is your time to see the manifestation. Don't, uh, don't be surprised in many days that you don't get a phone call of the the job of your dreams. Don't, don't be surprised in many days that certain opportunities that's going to come because it's manifestation time that you were able to live through the process. I know you didn't see it that way, but I want to encourage you in your faith that you were able to live through the process. So there's some things uh, that going to turn in your favor. There's some announcements that are going to be made about you. There is going to be some knocks on your door that are going to be favorable for you uh, because you were able to live through the process. You were able to live through the persecution. You were able to live through the uncertainty. And I want to tell you now that Jesus has crossed over, he's now gathering his disciples, the Bible says. But when they saw him, everybody who saw saw him, they did that. Some worship him, but the Bible says some doubt it. Some were excited and with great anticipation of who Jesus is, but some just couldn't shake it because the storm will do that to you. The wilderness will do that to you. I just don't believe that all this that I got, I'm really going to get out of it. I'll all these pills I'm taking, there's no way God's going to heal my body. He's not going to do it for me. I'm not saved enough. Y'all, you don't know to me outside of here. There's no way that God's going to give me the kind of grace to look past my faults and meet me at my point of need. I, I don't qualify, but I want to tell you because you crossed over in the year 24, it suggests that you qualify. Look at your name and say you qualify. Come on, I know 23 wasn't the best year. It wasn't your most holiest year. Let me pause there. <laughs> I know 23 wasn't your most holiest year. But the fact is, the grace of God allows you to make it in 24. I want to tell you that you qualify for God's next. Come on, somebody say, you got permission to be blessed by God. God has granted you access. Come on, hallelujah. Can you thank God for his grace today? 
Come on, thank God for God's grace. All I'm doing is praising him for his grace and his favor on my life. I'm trying to shift your mind right now to position yourself that you got a right. Somebody say, I got a right. Based on my ability to believe Jesus, you have a right. Somebody, thank God that you got a right. I told you, you can't follow me if you don't follow Jesus. So the day you make the choice to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want to tell you, you got it right. I confess my sins, I, that he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Somebody declare, I got it right. Bible says when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. But Jesus came and spoke to them. Now Jesus is on the other side and he says to them, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You, you have God's permission because, number one, of his authority. Amen. Somebody declare because of his authority. He, he, he's a sovereign God. He, he's in control. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all those that dwell therein. And, and if you happen to be a disciple, he has empowered you uh, with the tools to go. Somebody say you gotta go. You know, th there's, there's enough in you that you can go. You can go because God has granted you permission. He Welcome back. Hope you've enjoyed the program. Uh, First Lady Robinson, I enjoyed you and your guest as always. Yes. Uh, but even more so with this particular topic of prayer. And I, I love how they elaborated on the fact that the premise behind the book was to be more sensitive to the importance of praying for all members of the family. Yeah, every aspect of the family. And so I, I prayer is a kingdom technology. And so anytime you can put prayer technologies Kingdom Technologies and writing as a resource is a powerful thing. I like that. Yes. Kingdom Technology. Absolutely. In this tech savvy generation, That's what let us is. not forget. Prayer is a Kingdom Technology. That's great stuff. So That's we're looking stuff. forward to hearing more about this this book. Absolutely. And, and very timely too. Mm -hmm. you know, for you, prayer, um, how important has prayer been for very you? Very prayer, very important. I'm an intercessor and a prayer warrior. Our church is built on prayer. My life uh, is, is built on prayer. And actually our church, we have a three day prayer every month, three nights wow. of prayer every single no month. We've been doing this since the spring. We're going to go on through it to the new year, and it's, it, it holds us together. And I know for me, you know, now having been blessed uh, to be in this season of my life where mm -hmm. I've got grands, yes. I've got seven and one on the way, yes. and I find myself praying for them. That's why I caught my attention Absolutely. when they mentioned about the prayer, because I'm praying for that generation, Absolutely. Uh, you know, as well as doing things to make sure that I can impact their lives. Amen, for yeah. sure. Well, listen, we appreciate you as always. Mm -hmm. uh, you've impacted our son. Sunday morning, and we look forward to next month, okay? Thank you. Uh, and we look forward to next week with you guys. Hopefully, we've impacted your day to get you started off on the right track spiritually and emotionally and psychologically as you embrace another day's dawning. Just keep in mind that we'll be here next week, and until then, continue to walk in His grace and live in His glory. And we look forward to connecting with you right here, prayerfully, on Grace and Glory. Tell me what would have happened if Jesus did not. Without him in my life And where would I go without him at my side Who would wipe away these tears when I cry That's why everybody knows God lives in me In my life it shows God lives in me If loving him is wrong then I don't want to be right it's about that time you let him into your life Tell me who can change your mind Who can make it right Who can turn your rainy days into sunshine Who picked up the pieces when you threw it all away God did it God did it Let me tell you what happens when you let Things overflow And if you don't know Now you know You've got a seed in the ground 